Welcome to this episode of Ereka and today's guest is the director of National Center for Biological Sciences, a constant unit of uh, TIFR, Professor Satyajit Mayer. We are going to have a very interesting conversation with him. In 7th standard or 8th standard, I am sure all of you, you, me, everyone would have uh, studied that our bodies are made up of cells. Just like for example, a building is made up of a lot of bricks. But there is a very important difference between a brick and a cell. A brick is inactive, inert, it just sits in one place. It does nothing except that it is being there, that is all. But whereas a cell is active, every second, what about a second, even a fraction of a second, a cell is active doing something. How does a cell work and ensure still that it being in one place does lots of work like uh, you know a blood cell transmitting uh, oxygen to the place where it wants or a brain cell producing thoughts. Number of such work is being done in the center and we are going to have a very interesting conversation with him today and before that let us take a quick look at his brief profile. Professor Satyajit Mayer is a distinguished cell biologist. Professor Satyajit completed his masters from IIT Mumbai in chemistry and after that he went to New York for his PhD in life sciences from the Rockefeller University. Professor Mayer was also a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University during the period 1991 to 1995. After that, he moved to the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, where now he is the director. He has worked on various aspects of trafficking of molecule into and out of cells. His noteworthy studies include GPI-linked proteins and the elucidation of nanoscale rafts in cell membranes. His work has been recognized by several national and international awards, including the Infosys and the Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Award. Thank you, thank you for being with us. Uh, let's start with this simple question. What's a cell? Well, um, a cell is a fundamental unit of life. Uh, it is, as you said, the, it is the building block of every living system. Uh, and again, as you said, it's, a, it's completely different from a passive, inactive, inert brick it is fundamentally living. Um, and if one thinks about what the implications of that, that it, it is in fact the smallest entity that one, one can think of as having its own intrinsic life. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and a cell, as we all know, is in, you know, um, comes in different sizes. It's a bacterial cell um, and uh, of course, a virus is not, is not a cell. Virus is an inanimate object which infects a cell. But a cell um, can be either as, as small and, as a bacterium, or it can be a, a cell in any of us, a eukaryotic cell, a cell, which, a cell that has a constituent nucleus um, and, um, and a membrane that surrounds it. Right? So a cell is something that's living also because it is separated from its outside world. So, um, and many, many uh, activities happen inside the cell at many, many different time scales from the m microseconds to, the, uh, to hours and days and sometimes years as in, the, as in our neurons. It's all, a uh, lot of things are happening there. And uh, I hear that you work on a very specific uh, part of the cell, the cell membrane, uh, or uh, people might uh, call it a cell wall. A wall is a wall. What is that to work about? Well, I think that's, that's the biggest misconception that we've, we've had for a very long time. In fact, until, until very recently, maybe the 70s or the 80s, uh, all of us thought that the, that the wall that you call the, the cell, which, that we call the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of the cell uh, was thought to be a, just a passive separator of the cell from the outside. And, separating all the interesting activities that happen inside uh, as a passive sort of barrier through which uh, you know the cell can protect itself from the outside world 
But as we have begun to look more closely at the constituents of the cell membrane, the constituents are our favorite things, proteins and lipids. In fact, most of the fat in our body is in the membrane of cells. Uh, so these, uh, these, um, uh, the, the constituents of the membrane of a cell are anything but passive. Um, while the cell membrane was thought to be a passive two-dimensional fluid, and fluid in the conventional sense of a fluid, well mixed with very little order on the, on the short, uh, on the long scale, maybe somewhat ordered on the short scale, uh, the cell membrane is, is a whole world unto itself. It, it is organized at every, every different scale, even though the entire system You made system a very is, interesting point. Yeah. I want to come back to it because it's very, very curious. You said cell membrane is like a liquid. Yes. Oh my God. I mean, we all thought that cell membrane should be something like a solid, you know, maybe like a plastic, but then something very solid. You're saying it's a liquid. Yes. Huh? Uh, how does... Yeah. So, so, the, so the cell membrane is built of, uh, of lipids and lipids can form uh, bilayers and, you know, because their lipids are fundamentally, uh, um, you know, they have two kinds of tropes. They have a hydrophobic part and they have a hydrophilic part. And when those lipids come together, many of the lipids that, that form the membrane of our cells, they can self-organize into, or self-assemble rather, into structures that are called bilayers. And these bilayers are fluid. Uh, so they are fluid like a normal fluid, but they're in two dimensions. But there's order that's imposed on this fluid bilayer uh, from the activity of, of or everything that's inside a cell. So if you look, if you, the fluid nature comes from the fact that it's a two-dimensional uh, self-assembled uh, system, which where molecules are, can move about quite freely. Um, plants, on the other hand, so this is the, uh, the, the outer shell of an animal cell. Okay, yeah. But the outer shell of a plant cell is much more rigid. It, has, it is a cell wall which is built by the, by again, built by processes that happen within, within the cell membrane, but it's built more as a scaffold. Uh, but the animal cell is typically this very fluid matrix. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, you have been working on this uh, cell membrane. What kind of major work, suppose if I ask you three major work that you are uh, kind of very proud of or, uh, you know, satisfied with, I mean, if one can use those words, uh, would you say about? Right. I think this, this very fact that uh, the cell membrane is not a chemically equilibrated two-dimensional fluid uh, is something that, uh, you know, has been, has been thought about as, some, as a property that something that's surrounding a living system, uh, you know, should have. But being, but being able to actually come to grips with that property of, of a organized system that is present within this two-dimensional fluid uh, is something that I would argue is what the work from my own laboratory and the laboratory of my colleagues, uh, you know, soft matter physicist Madan Rao um, have contributed to. Um, that understanding that the, the components of the cell membrane, molecules in the cell membrane, are organized by energy-consuming processes uh, is one, I, I'd say, fundamental discovery that I, I, I think we have, we have been able to contribute to. Um, a, a couple of other, you know, things that we've, we've been, uh, been actively working on and I think are major contributions for my own laboratory are how the cell membrane can mold itself to, to, um, to take up material from the outside uh, and also respond to uh, aspects of regulating the physical property and the physical composition of the membrane in terms of being able to maintain the actual composition, meaning the, the chemical composition of the membrane and its, uh, and its physical tension. Uh, and these are properties that have come about because the cell creates uh, pits that are able to take up excess membrane and along with it material into, into the inside of the cell for transport into different parts of the cell. So that's a process called endocytosis. So we, we've actually uh, been involved in discovering mechanisms in, that are fundamental to all cells that are creating these endocytic processes. Um, and a third, uh, uh, I, I would say, a program in the lab um, 
is to understand how these two elements, the organization and transport, together contribute to the cell being able to engage with the outside world, to, to connect and interpret signals that come from the outside world, which are uh, located in proteins that are called receptors, which when they connect to information from the outside, like chemical information or even physical information like stresses and forces, they need to transmit that information to the inside of the cell. And the membrane and its specific composition serves as a uh, information uh, modifier or an in some information filter. And uh, this is something that we've, we are now you know, taking on because now we understand the fundamental processes behind organization and, trans and, and uh, maintenance of composition and tech. That's a, that's a very interesting. We are having a very, very interesting conversation, but then we need to take a very small break. After the break, I'm going to ask him a very interesting question. We have all seen uh, this uh, cartoon serial, Popeye the Sailor Man. He is fond of spinach, which is supposed to be rich in iron. And absence of iron causes anemia and many other problems. How does the iron that we uh, consume goes to the cell? How does it enter the cell? We will ask him, we will see his response, but then don't go away. After the break, we will continue this conversation. Welcome to this episode of IREKA and we are having a very, very interesting conversation with uh, Dr. Satyajit Mayer, Director of National Center for Biological Sciences, part of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Before the break, I was telling our audience that uh, I am going to ask you a question. Let us say iron, you know, in form of uh, let us say greens that we consume or uh, folate, which is part of uh, let us say vegetables and greens which are required for our human body. I mean, like cells need them to make, uh, uh, let us say, DNA. Folates right. are needed for that. And then iron is needed by uh, our blood cells right. to transport oxygen. Absence of it is going to make the red cell inactive. Right. How does this thing which goes from outside, goes inside the cell? But whereas, for example, certain things which are not needed for the cell is not accepted by the cell membrane. Right. How does it make selective acceptance and non-acceptance? Right. Well, very good question because the, the, uh, the cell actually uh, builds receptors or has receptors that can, um, for the, in the context of iron, uh, cells, and this is a universal property of almost every eukaryotic cell. Okay. Bacterial cells do things differently. Differently, okay. Uh, so eukaryotic cells have uh, uh, acquired receptors which can bind iron. Or in fact, what they do is they, most animal cells bind a protein called transferrin. Transferrin is associated with iron uh, and it binds to, um, uh, you know, uh, you know ferric, uh, ferrous um, iron. And, it, and this transferrin is bound to the transferrin receptor, at the, which, is, which is expressed at the cell surface. When it's bound to the transferrin receptor, the, this receptor is then brought into the cell by an endocytic process. And then inside the endosome, which is the little vesicle, the iron is reduced. Uh, so, um, in, in fact, it's in the ferric form in the outside, in the ferrous form in the inside. And that reduced iron is then transported out of this vesicle by transporters into the cytoplasm of the cell, where it is again absorbed by other proteins. Free iron, by the way, is very toxic to the cell. So the iron, the cell doesn't like to keep iron in a free form. It always is bound to something or the other. But this is the way it takes up iron. And then... Uh, Folates, on the other hand, are bound to another type of receptor, which the cells bring in through a different endocytic process. And this is some, a process that we've been actually working on for many years now, um, and have identified that it operates by completely different rules. So, so had we thought that these two processes are taken up by this common mechanism called endocytosis, we couldn't have been further away from the truth, because when we look at these things more specifically, more closely, by using all the uh, you know, advanced imaging technology that we have at our disposal, we find that these two receptors, when they go into the cell, they actually are going in through completely different packets. And the mechanism of how these packets are built is actually something that we've been working on as well in our lab for many, many years. Uh, but, but you're right, I mean, the, the, the cell actually takes things up that it needs and the rest of it, it just rejects. It, it just rejects because it's a, it's a barrier. Right. It's actually a 
fantastic So it's value. like a security gate where you have to show your ID card only with the valid people are let inside, the others are not allowed. That's right. That, that's that's right. some kind of a mechanism. That's right. So, you know, Very uh, yeah. interesting. So, so these fundamental processes that are involved in taking a material are also hijacked by uh, pathogens, by, by viruses, by bacteria, uh, so that they also gain entry into the cell. It's like having a uh, like you know, forged uh, entry <laughs> right. pass, right? Right. It's yeah, like okay. having having you know somebody who's forged their identity yeah. to come into your uh, your system. So the so pathogens actually deploy. In fact, the study of pathogens have told us a lot about the study of the mechanisms that are involved in taking in molecules because the pathogens have pathogens are actually the best cell biologists. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting point. You are now heading a very interesting institute, I mean very important institute, National Center for Biological Sciences, which is celebrating 25 years of its existence today. Uh, what kind of major work that you are doing here and why this institute? Right. So, um, in the early 80s, um, the National Center for Biological Science was first thought of by uh, Professor Obed Siddiqui, uh, working at the, at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. As, as the head of the Department of Molecular Biology. He felt that for biology to really flourish, one needs to study biology at every scale, at all scales. And so he began to conceive of an institution which uh, could be um, an institution that would harbor under one roof biology that, op that was concerned itself with molecular scales or, sc or in every scale up to ecosystems, or scales of the nanosecond to scales of evolution, to the time scales of evolution, uh, or the time scales of the formation of Earth, or life on Earth. Um, so he felt that unless, to study biology, you really need to have an institution that has, spans all these scales. 25 years later, I, I'm you know, happy to say, and you know, in uh, the uh, uh, you know, wisdom of Obed uh, has actually, I would argue, been realized in some sense because we have biology happening at almost every scale uh, on, on this campus. From the molecular scale to the scale of the study of ecosystems, every one of these scales is represented here. So what you mean to say is like from uh, molecular level to uh, even ecosystem, which means that this institute would have people uh, like working on uh, biophysics. To That's right. ecology and uh, evolutionary biologist. Yes, it's a, it's a kind of a interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary kind of an institution, right? Right, right. And and we also have people who work. Um, and this is more recent. I think to understand all these scales, we also need to have people who are coming in from the disciplines of physics and math and uh, computer science, um, and uh, looking to create a synthesis of some of these scales. Because unless we bring in the natural sciences uh, in terms of theories and ideas and hypotheses, uh, coming from the, the physical sciences, it's going to be hard for us to understand how these scales are put together. Very interesting. Uh, you made a very interesting point, which I think uh, we should note. This is a biology institute, but then there are people from computer sciences and mathematics who work here. But whereas in our uh, school, we think that if you're going to take biology, it is without maths. Right? We will take a very short break. After the break, we will continue with this conversation and then we are going to ask him a very interesting question. He is in a biology institute and then there is a very major evil in our society, caste. What does biology tell about caste? We will ask him after the break. Don't go away. We will take a very short break. Welcome back to Eureka and we are having a very interesting conversation with the director of National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore, Professor Satyajit Meir. Thank you for being with us. We are having a very interesting conversation about your work, your institute. I would like to ask some other question. How did you land up in research? You know, as student, people would imagine becoming a doctor, engineer, maybe an IAS officer. You know, pilot. Right. I wanted to be an engine driver when I was in 8th standard. Right. Okay. Uh, research is not something that usually comes to a young kid's mind. How did you become a researcher? Well, I think uh, serendipity is the one is the one defining factor. I, you know, like you wanted to be an engine driver, I, I actually wanted to be a cricket player. Cricket player. <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. And, um, and I was very serious about cricket, but, uh, but on for some, uh, you know, some reasons of, 
you know, unfortunate pressure from our society, I went and gave this exam for the IIT when I was in the 11th standard um, and got into the IITs. And, you know, to my, to my uh, uh, dismay, I got in. But, and um, and my, my father, who was also a very keen cricket player, he said, OK, I, know, I understand your anguish. Why don't you play cricket? Uh, and I was, you know, thankful to him. And I was playing cricket with some of, you know, some of our former members of our uh, members of our Indian in, Indian team, like Kiran More. Uh, he was India's wicketkeeper and actually a good friend. Uh, he um, uh, and we were we used to play cricket together. And I was from Baroda. Uh, and then um, my passion for cricket, although it was very strong, um, my father sort of said, you know, why don't I explore other aspects of life because he said you'll never be a cricket player all your life but you might be able to be an academic all your life and and he was sort of academically minded then i went back again and gave the exam for iit and this time you know this was the 12th standard and and one had to then make a decision about what you wanted to do yeah, yeah. and i ex and he said why don't you just go and explore the fact that you've got into this iit uh, and this was not so far from baroda in bombay and i went to bombay and uh, uh, in bombay my um, you know, the uh, invitation, I mean, the, the committee that looks at you when you first come in, they said, you know, you've got a very high rank, you should become a mechanical engineer. I mean, I, I had really no interest at that time in any of these things, except that I felt that I was getting interested in science. I had a very good biology teacher in school, and, and he had all these jars full of animals, and, and he was, very, you know, he was very, very enthusiastic about about biology, also thought about evolution, and I was getting intrigued by this. And, and physics also was something that was on my mind. But when I went to IIT, I realized that, you know, I was not that keen on engineering. And having been forced into engineering, I think you, when you force somebody into something, they always rebel. Right? And I decided to rebel. And I went, spent two years or three years at the IIT, and then at the IIT, they, uh, uh, there's a, you know, there were actually pure science people uh, who were working there who seemed to be more relaxed and had a different as attitude to life. And, um, and I got involved in uh, conversations with some people in the chemistry department, especially somebody who had just returned uh, from, uh, from a, a stint at, at Harvard trying to understand how membranes of the cell work. And he uh, was uh, very uh, persuasive and said, look, why don't I transfer to the chemistry department? I attempted to do that, was blocked by the IIT administration, and then eventually I joined the chemistry department. All the while I was playing cricket in Bombay. Uh, I was playing cricket in Bombay. We were playing, I was playing for IIT Bombay, and we were playing with Ravi Shastri's team against, uh, in Bombay University at that time. And, you know, I was having a great time playing cricket. I never for the once thought I would be a researcher, but I was in, beginning to enjoy studying, beginning to enjoy just reading about science and biology. And then this in interaction with this researcher uh, at IIT Bombay in the chemistry department just changed my view about everything. Research suddenly became incredibly exciting. And the fact that one could understand something about a living system from fundamental principles of physics and chemistry was just the most you know, absolutely fascinating thing I could ever imagine. And that, I think that spark happened at that time. So you mean to say that uh something like uninteresting stuff, you know, uh, equations of motion, Newton's equations of motion or Newton's laws of physics have its impact on biology, a very interesting system, living, thriving. We thought physics for inanimate world and then biology for animate world, you say that there is a connection. Right, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, you're right. And, and also the, the idea that you have this, chem this b backdrop of physics and chemistry discussing and properties about molecules, but suddenly you have a system which is living, right? How does one begin to actually connect the two? And th this was a question that began, you know, to intrigue me even, I, 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 if I recall, those were the kind of questions that were beginning to interest me at that, at that time. And I must say that's been, that's remained throughout my career. Before the break, uh, we told our viewers that we would be discussing about the caste and biology. Caste is one of the major evils of our Indian society and a lot of people think that there is some kind of a biological basis for caste. 
you know like uh, there are different kinds of uh, plants i mean even if you take uh, rice plant there are different varieties people think that uh, caste is like one of those kind of varieties and it's uh, biological and real as a biologist what do you think about it well i i, I think if you think of the human beings as one population um the 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 one of the evils of of having a population which which thinks about uh progress in a very linear manner um has been the idea of eugenics and and i think and i'm saying this you know as a biologist uh today um you know eugenics is something that one has always to be wary of and to con- to com- conflate caste with biology is in a sense a kind of eugenics that that uh, is being try- is being promoted and and i don't need to say more about eugenics because you know we know where eugenics has taken this this world i mean if you think about hitler's germany or uh, or the eugenics movements in the early parts of the last century uh they have been perhaps the most corrosive ideas uh that have b- beset and have also been supported by you know f- uh, i would say false science um but biology today can completely dispel those ideas because if you think about caste as uh as interbreeding communities small interbreeding communities one can just see the consequences of consanguinity that caste would in- inevitably bring because they are naturally small communities and this consanguinity can have tremendous consequences in terms of amplifying you know rare diseases amplifying uh, morbidity uh and certainly with uh with no notion of uh um purity you said consanguineous marriage usually when we say that it's about uh, marriage between close relatives you are implying that uh, if a small community is marrying among themselves i mean you know a caste group marrying only among themselves for a long time that group itself becomes like uh, close relatives in terms of uh, biology that's right it will it will lead to sort of uh, you know um, recessive mutations being being expressed it can lead i mean sort of medically it's actually a fairly well understood uh very well understood way by which you know diseases that are encoded in mutations in genes can be will get expressed because inter interbreeding can actually begin to bring those about with this interesting note we need to end today's eureka we are having a very very interesting conversation and we could have continued this conversation for quite long time there are a lot of very interesting stuff but unfortunately the time stops us and then we need to end it today we'll continue this kind of a conversation next week with with another interesting scientist keep watching eureka